and uh, welcome to this week's episode of The Good Dram Show with me, Chris Goodrum. As per usual, a big thank you to everybody that watched last week's episode of the show. Uh, liked, commented, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think I've caught up with everybody's comments from last week, so thank you very much for that. Um, a lot of the comments did seem to sort of um, touch on the, uh, the, the, the thorny... Uh, issue of of, uh, of retail pricing um, and it, it is what it is at the moment um, you know there, there's like everything in life the price of whiskey is uh, indeed going upwards and um, yeah no, not an awful lot we can do and uh, you know, so part of the reasoning for today's episode of the show was a kind of like uh, a, a desire to sort of rebalance I suppose and uh, show some spirits that were slightly slightly more affordable and obviously the whole concept of affordability is now somewhat slightly stretched um, you know um, and as far as I'm aware the, the um, price range for the spirits that I'm, t I'm sh uh, sort of sharing with you guys today is between about 30 and 60 quid which all right, 60 quid, it's all, all perception, isn't it, whether you think that's an affordable amount or not. But uh, anyway, at least it's um, <laughs> not, not 160 quid. So anyway, uh, the other reason for today's episode of the show was it's been a while since I've done uh, an episode of the show on um, English spirits. I won't say whiskey because there's not all whiskey in today's episode. So, oh yes, get something different in. Um, always like to do that every now and again. And no, there's no gin, so it's fine. Um, you can keep watching. Uh, anyway, so um, yeah, two two reasons. One, obviously, it's been a while since I've done any um, an episode of the show on English spirits, and secondly. Um, later on today, the uh, England women's football team um, play the old adversary Germany in the uh, European Championship final, um, which is really cool. So again, you know, it's kind of tying in with uh, supporting England, shall we say. Um, I obviously won't refer to them by their uh, current collective noun that has been used in the press because it's deemed... Um, oh, what, what do they call it? Oh, sexist. Um, anyway, I'm not going to go there. I don't get involved in sort of race, religion, all that kind of stuff. You know, uh, I leave leave that well alone. I'll just comment on on the spirits. And talking of comments, obviously, any comments that I do make in today's episode of the show are wholly my own and have no bearing on the company that employs me. Yeah, just just thought we'd get that out of the way. So anyway. Um, Lots of different spirits, some interesting stuff hopefully, um, several different distilleries, I'm not obviously going to go into any great depth about uh, the distilleries themselves, uh, we'll be looking at, I'll just give you a brief rundown, I mean you can find out, uh, the links will be in the, the box below should you wish to look at, uh, look up some more information on them. So we can be looking at a distillery called the Henston Distillery in Shropshire. We're obviously going to be looking at uh, the St George's Distillery in Norfolk. We're going to be looking at the White Peak Distillery uh, just up the road in Derbyshire. And we're going to be looking at the Pocket Full of Stones Distillery in um, uh, Cornwall. Uh, obviously all bar the Henston Distillery I have featured their spirits on the show before so you should be well well uh, known with about them um, and hopefully you'll know a bit more about the Henson Distillery so by the time we finish uh, finish the episode so anyway um, not a great deal else to say apart from let's have a look at today's lineup Okay, so um, yeah, it's going to kick off with uh, a couple of the Henston bottlings. Um, came my way relatively recently, um, about a month or so ago. I got an email saying, um, oh, we make spirits, are you interested? And I thought, well, why not? You know, let's have a look at another English distillery. So we're going to kick off with their, uh, what they've called their Old Dog Corn Liquor. Um, obviously, um, it's not a liqueur, liquor. Um, so this is a mash of corn, wheat, barley, um, aged for eight, uh, eight months in American oak. So a corn whiskey at the end of the day. And uh, yeah, some corn whiskies, are, well, by their kind of very nature, tend to be relatively simple. And a lot of them have this kind of um, 
burnt caramel, burnt sort of toffee kind of character, which kind of is a bit jarring. I mean, so far in all the years I've ever tasted corn spirit, I've only really ever found one that I really, really liked. So, uh, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see about that one, shall we? Next uh, bottling is their single malt whiskey. Uh, oh, by the way, the uh, corn liqueur, uh, liquor is bottled at 41.5. Um, this is, uh, like I said, the, uh, their, their single malt whiskey. Uh, it's three years old, um, aged in ex bourbon casks, and apparently non chill filtered. I mean, I mean I say that as, as a bit of a surprise, but the fact is bottled at 43.8, and I was always under the impression that you couldn't get away with non-chill filtering at anything less than 46%. But apparently, this is non-chill filtered, and it is 43.8, and, well, there you go. You learn something new every day, don't you? Uh, bottling number three we're moving on to is uh, the English 11-year-old. I believe it was the... I think it was the first age statement bottling they released, I th or did they, no, I think they released a 10, didn't they? An anniversary bottling, but I think this was the first kind of core bottling, in inverted commas, uh, that they released with an age statement. So again, uh, this particular sample comes from a bottle that was bottled in 2020, um, and it's bottled at uh, obviously 46%. Uh, bottling number four is brand spanking new. Uh, this is the uh, Wireworks uh, Batch 3 2022. It was uh, bottled at 46.2%, released uh, in July, um, so not that long ago, <laughs> and obviously bottled uh, in, in March. And uh, it's uh, predominantly STR cast and a bit of bourbon, so uh, uh, we shall see what uh, that's like. I remember the... Um, first batch was uh, was interesting good work in progress um, not expecting any great sort of huge uh, sort of jump in maturity considering it's actually been a few months since they did the first release but it was just just nice to kind of chart its progress I suppose um, then we're going back to uh, the Henston distillery and this is called um, non paral I think it's paral I mean god I'm doing an episode of the show on English spirits and I can't pronounce one of the names. I mean, what's the world coming to? Um, anyway, it's um, apple brandy. Uh, I believe the non pareil is uh, the, the name of the apple. Um, yeah, kind of quite intrigued by that, to be honest with you. And intrigued by the final bottle of the day. This is from the Pocket Full of Stones distillery. This is uh, Morverin Absinthe, um, bottled at the not un inconsiderable ABV of 66%. Um, nothing like saving the, the, <laughs> the most alcoholic to last, is it? Um, the interesting thing about this is, obviously, <laughs> still makes me laugh. People have this misconception about absinthe. You know, they come into the shop and go, Ooh, absinthe, doesn't that get you stoned? And it's like, no, it doesn't. It was the bloody laudanum that they were all quaffing to, uh, that's what got them stoned. It wasn't the bloody uh, absinthe. Anyway, um... So yes, it is distilled with wormwood. This wormwood, incidentally, is actually grown in Cornwall. I didn't realise you could grow it in this country. Um, I'm not, I must admit, I am not an aficionado of uh, uh, absinthe. I have tasted it from time to time. Um, what was the one, the most, inf the most well-known one that I tasted? Sort of not, oh, there's a guy called Gerard Brew or something like that. And he kind of revert. he got a bottle of very old traditional absinthe or something like that and then kind of reversed engineered it or something like that um it was a, a, a real absinthe geek i'm me i am not an absinthe geek at all um anyway so it's made with cornish wormwood which is really quite impressive which is grown on the cliffs close to the distillery in zenor uh, apparently um and uh, they also include some cornish seaweed as well as a botanical just to make it slightly different obviously the you know original um, absinthe uh, didn't include seaweed as far as I'm aware but uh, again like I said I'm not an absinthe geek and the interesting thing if you look about the the, the, um, uh, the sort of promo stuff for it it's all features um, a tale about the legend of the mermaid uh, Morverin of Zenor don't know quite what the 
if there's any link between her and Absinthe, I suspect not. Um, but it's a nice tale anyway, and it, it's it, it's it's a nice picture on the bottle and uh, the, the the advertising stuff. So uh, yeah, why not? I'm 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 down with that, as they say. Uh, anyway, um, enough of that. Obviously, uh, tales of uh, of uh, watery tarts and um, what have you is uh, all well and good. It's the the juice in the bottle that. Um, uh, that uh, is, uh, is is key here. So uh, I'm going to stop talking and uh, let's taste some spirit. Then. Right. Okay. So we're going to kick off with the uh, the corn. Let's see what the nose gives us on this, then, shall we? Hmm. That's a lovely nose. Um, sweet, corny. Um, not too sweet. Um. Good chunk of oak, um, estuary. Do you know what? Reminds me very much of Macmyra, and that's that's high praise, I can tell you. Um, a little bit of citrus, just enough to kind of balance. Um, a little bit of ginger, some white fruit. You know what? I think I found another corn liqueur that I really like. Corn liqueur, corn liquor that I really like. Um, yeah, like I said, most of the time they have that kind of burnt sort of toffee burnt caramel kind of edge and it's sort of like you know they're a bit like what, what's the most well-known one uh, mellow or mellow corn yellow corn or whatever it was called mellow corn i think it is you know heaven hill i mean that is grim uh it has to be said um this on the other hand like i said about 30 quid a bottle it's gorgeous it's lovely i love this nose um it's just ticks all my boxes as as you know i love estuary fruity whiskies not hugely complex does what it says on the tin really nicely and see what it does on the palate A bit sweeter on the palate, a bit more overt American oak, lots of soft, corny, citric, and soft yellow fruits, um, touch of ginger, spice, um, not ginger spice, but you know, oh, <laughs> ginger spice, um, a little bit short. Um, a touch bittering on the finish, but do you know what? I really like that. Uh, again, it's got this kind of sort of Mac Myery kind of thing going on, this estuary fruit and an obvious creamy uh, American oak. Um, it's a lovely mouthful. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a touch on the sweet side, I'll give it that. Yeah, if I was being overly pedantic and pulling it apart, possibly a little more ABV might just have just push that citric note a bit further up just to sort of take a little bit more of that sweetness off but you know what i think it's absolutely gorgeous and for 30 quid well you know yeah nice when you feel the right, okay so moving on to the henston single malt let's see what the nose gives us on this end shall we okay well i can see they're kind of obviously gone down the current way of producing a spirit for early maturation estuary fruit so i'm guessing long fermentation cool fermentation i would imagine um so we got barley honey citrus white fruit a little bit of vanilla um i mean it's a pleasant nose it's a lovely nose in actual fact again um not overly oaky uh which is good um a little bit more balance a little bit more spirit character but that spirit character is really soft there's no no off notes no rose petal no ma no oiliness you know it is it's delightful it's lovely of course it always it does kind of bring up the question of of how is this spirit going to uh evolve how is it going to sort of cope with oak maturation given the fact that it is kind of designed to be um bottled at a fairly young age um but you know that's obviously one of the fun things that we will find out no doubt a few years down the line um anyway i 
I like this. I think it's a lovely nose. Again, it ticks all my kind of boxes. Um, all right, you can argue at 50 quid, little expensive maybe, um, or 50 odd quid. Um, but, you know, I like it. Let's see what the pass on. Well, it kicks off with with some some oak, not too obtrusive, um, pleasant oak, vanilla. Moves through into barley, citrus, a little bit of white fruit. Oak starts to come back on the mid palate. A little bit of bittering oak on the finish. Um, nice creaminess there. Good length. Really nice progression. What more can you ask for? I mean, I really like that. Okay, so it's not the most complex of spirit. I've ever cross ever come across but for a three-year-old like I said beautifully balanced um, with the oak not oily not fainty no rose petal no mar no hardness I mean it really is just just a lovely a lovely drink it's just lovely to taste it um, and you know at the end of the day yeah can't ask for more than that can you? if you feel the same inside how like Okay, so let's move on to the English 11 year old. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? That's a nice nose. Um, aromatic, again, almost in the tropical fruit end of the spectrum. Apricot, apple, pear, grippy barley, a little bit of honey, some grippy oak, a touch of spice, a little bit of a herbalness kind of coming through as well. Um, Slight balsamic note just starting to emerge. Um, I mean, that's that's really complex. That's a lovely nose again. Um, it's got sort of interest. It's got intrigue. It's not simple. Uh, it's plenty going on. Uh, there's a, a little bit of an edge to it, um, but a, not, a, not an edgy edge, if you see what I mean. Um, hope that makes sense. Um, Hmm, I like that. Again, you know, we're not talking sort of huge amounts of oak. I think really quite nicely balanced. Um, again, 50 quidish kind of territory. Um, so I think, you know, again, you know, good value. Um, so I'll pass on. Mm, lovely length. Re again, really good progression. Kicks off with the drier barley and citrus and then the sweeter American oak just starts to move in um, along with the developing slightly sort of tropical sort of apricot, pear, apple. Um, gets a little sort of sawdusty on the mid palate, that sort of, you know, maturing kind of uh, sawdusty American oak character um, quite citric on the finish again finishing with the barley the oak sort of like is sandwiched in between sort of like you know these layers of barley and that is it is a lovely layered whiskey at the end of the day um, and um, I think to a certain extent that I think some people have kind of forgotten about the St George's distillery considering it was the first English distillery and it's been around now for sort of what 12 13 14 years i think um and you've got all these newer distilleries like henston and and white peaks and what have you cropping up and they've, and they're sort of now the focus of attention and everybody's sort of like forgotten about the fact that the english distillery it, you know is still there and producing some absolutely gorgeous whiskey so i think yeah hmm that's absolutely lovely Okay, so let's move on to the uh, the wire works in. Let's see what uh, this batch gives us in. Tense, young, gristy. Lots of STR cast, lots of whiny red fruit. Quite tannic, but those tannins are soft. And again, it's kind of leading me to believe that Cooperages are now um, a lot more uh, comfortable with the, the whole STR business, 
excuse me, um, and uh, I must admit, there's a lot of distilleries that are, they're doing, you know, the modern distilleries are doing one or two things. It's either the sort of like, you know, um, long estuary fermentation, American oak, or in this case, I don't think quite so long, slightly more characterful spirit, shove it into a combination of uh, American oak sherry and, and STR. These seem to be the two, essentially the two current blueprints, shall we say. Um, and you can certainly smell that this is not a soft and sort of estuary kind of spirit. It's got some, it's got some cojones, uh, it's got some edginess, it's got a touch of, um, uh, of rose petal, there is a rawness there behind the, uh, the STR. Um, possibly a little heavy on the STR, maybe. Um, I would like to have seen a little bit more American oak, but there's a little bit of it. There's a touch of soil, a touch of peat. Um, doesn't kind of come across quite as peated as the previous release, but I I'm guessing that's probably more to do with the the balance of bourbon to STR casks, and you often tend to find with a lot of wine casks, it does kind of take the edge off um, peat notes. Um, but again, I, I really like this. It's work in progress. It's not quite there yet, um, but it's a snapshot of where it is, and I don't think where it is is actually too bad at all. It's certainly, you know, not undrinkable um, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Hmm, see what that's like. Okay, good progression. Again, kicks off with lots of juicy red fruits. It's quite really silky, um, with a sort of almost kind of um sort of glycerol-y kind of note. Um, the STR tannins do start to build on the mid palate and they do start to get increasingly bitter but again there's so much weight of, of fruit, um, of STR, wine fruit, um, that the, the, the bittering never really kind of gets out of hand. Again a little bit of rawness of spirit on the aftertaste, a little bit of rose petal, um, a little bit of oiliness um just it's it, because it's not quite there yet um but again like i said it's work in progress and it's interesting um it's got a lovely intensity i mean it really kind of like you know has plenty of of character um obviously this is a spirit that i think will mature really nicely and again it's another one that i kind of look forward to um hopefully following over the course of time because again I mean, uh, it's it's certainly like I said, it's built built to last. Or what's it, what? How do they say? It? Yeah, um, yeah, not not built for speed, but you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah, anyway, it's it's got that. It's got the sort of not quite traditional character in in you know inverted commas, but it's certainly sort of more in that kind of style. And I think this is just going to kind of carry on maturing really nicely. And I think it's just going to be like I say, really intriguing to kind of like you know chart its progress. So. Nice. All right, okay, so now we're going off slightly a bit more left field now. Um, so this is the uh, uh, non pareil uh, uh, apple brandy from Henston. Let's see what the nose is on this end. You know what, stupidly, when I first kind of like got the sample, I was expecting a cider apple brandy. Why? I don't know. It's not called cider apple brandy. It has no cider apples in it as far as I'm aware, unless these are used for cider, I don't know. But So it kind of has a... it's a bit of an odd nose. Um, it's kind of... it's kind of... it edges more towards Calvados, um, for the, you know, if you know Calvados. Um, but there's a kind of almost mezcal-y kind of sort of edginess to it. So, you know, you um, try and get your head around this, you know, imagine, a, uh, you know, uh, the bastard child of a mezcal and a, uh, and a Calvados, and mm, yeah, you're probably not a million miles away from, from this, and I like it, it's a bit weird, it has to be said, but it's got plenty of apple character, um, as you would expect, it's got like that mezcal-y kind of smoky pulped white fruit, it's got that slight sort of 
almost kind of espadrine um, stringency. Um, it's a little bit of an apple, a little bit of that's more than a little bit of apple. I meant to say it's a little bit of vanilla, not apple. Um, there's plenty of bloody apple. Um, it's made from bloody apples. You'd expect it to have apple character, wouldn't you? Um, honestly. Um, okay, palette. A little fuller on the palate, a little bit more fleshy apple, but again, it's got that sort of mescal like kind of astringency. Um, a little bit of almost kind of wheat flakes on, on the finish. It's got a, a wheatiness, uh, sort of, you know, I can't think of another way to describe it, to be honest with you. It really is quite a bizarre spirit, it has to be said. I mean, it's, it's intriguing, it's interesting. Um, it's got a nice apple-y aftertaste. Um, and like I said, it's it's not cider apple brandy, you know. Um, it, like I said, uh, it's it's kind of, you know, a combination of mezcal and, um, and Calvados. And um, it's not particularly expensive. So, you yeah, know, I, I think if you like slightly quirky, slightly odd spirits, then, um, yeah, give it a try. Feel the same inside, how like Right, okay, and talking of slightly quirky and odd spirits, uh, we're on to the, uh, the Morveren Absinthe. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? 66%. Hmm. You know what? It doesn't smell like it's 66%, and that's dangerous. Um, okay, it's kind of classically absinthe. It's wormwood, licorice, aniseed, a um, little bit of woody spice. A little bit of salt. I'm getting a little bit of um, of uh, seaweedy notes, but but the wormwood is kind of pretty much front and centre, which is what you'd expect from an absinthe at the end of the day. There's a, a little bit of a sweetness to it, and um, I guess at the end of the day you have to like sort of aniseed licorice to kind of get on with these kind of spirits. If you don't, you're never going to like them, and. Um, I don't mind licorice. It's been years since I've had licorice. Um, I always remember those kind of licorice rolls you used to get. You know, it's just suck on. Oh, yeah, that's going back a few years. And the penny, the the blackjacks. God, do you remember? Oh, I'm not going to go there. You know, the old <laughs> old sweets from the uh, from the seventies. Um, anyway, yeah. So, hmm, interesting. Let's see the pass on. That does not like taste like it's 66%. That is seriously, seriously dangerous stuff. Um, oily, uh, yeah, okay, the alcohol is coming through on the finish. It shortens and, and there is that sort of alcohol bitterness on the palate. Um, but it has quite a nice absinthe, actually. It's very soft, it's very smooth, lovely beginning. Um, it's quite earthy, there's a wormwood, there's a licorice, the aniseed, a little bit of saltiness. A little bit of seaweediness. Um, it's got a little bit of darkness there. Um, like I said, the, the, the finish is pretty much kind of masked by the alcohol, um, but it's got some intensity. I mean, whoa, you know, that's that that's a real kind of hit of absinthe. That has to be said. Um, Go and put a little drop of water with it just to see what that does to uh, to it. Now, one of the things that I found with absinthe is that as soon as you stick water with it, it becomes like bloody soap. It really smells soapy. Now, um, this doesn't. This has retained its cleanness. Um, if that's a word, cleanness, is that right? Cleanliness, crispness, freshness. I mean, you know what I'm getting at. Um, it's not gone all soapy. Um, it's pretty much the same as it was neat. Um, you know, aniseed, licorice, wormwood, salt. I mean, there's a, a slight, all right, there's a slight, you know, just a little bit of a soapiness now. I was kind of lying, um, but that's only kind of just becoming apparent. But like I said, I remember tasting some of the sort of, you know, the traditional um, 
French absence and, and uh, you know you, as soon as you stick water with it they become like bloody you know aniseed soap you know it's like and you think where's the fun in that um, but this is still retains that kind of fresh and edgy element um, so yeah let's look past right now Oh my god, that's bitter. Cough. <laughs> yeah. uh, oof. Um, hmm. Bitter is not the word for it. I mean, that really enhances the bitterness. I mean, there's a slight softness, but it's kind of lingering, kind of right at the edges, and the bitterness is just kind of like hammering the tongue. Um, that's intense. Um, it's still kind of, my tongue is tingling, it has to be said. Um, it feels almost numb. Um, even though I put water with it, uh, yeah, it, it bizarrely tastes more alcoholic with water than, than it doesn't. How the hell does that work? I mean, um, I'm, it's great. I love it. I mean, pff, don't think I'd want to sort of spend the entire evening drinking the damn stuff, but you know, a dram, I suppose at the end of the night, just to kind of like, you know, bitter the hell out of my palate would be quite fun. Um, mm, yeah. Right, so you, you need to have a slight masochistic sort of uh, edge to your character to enjoy that one, I think. But, you yeah, know, that's, that's, that's no shrinking violet. I mean, you know, that's, that's, you're not going to forget tasting that. That's all I can say, which is uh, <laughs> got to be a good one. episode of the show well uh, I don't know about you guys but um, it's it's been a been a great episode I think um, and um, yeah big thank you to um, everybody involved that kindly sent me samples of Henston to um, pocket full of stones uh, the uh, wireworks and the English whiskey were sort of samples that uh, I, I acquired otherwise but anyway um, yeah the, uh, the 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 corn whiskey you know what like I said at the beginning of the show, I said I've only ever tasted one corn whiskey that I really like. Well, now it's two. That's lovely. If you like corn whiskey, and, what, and it is a classic, you know, it's all about the sort of freshness and, and, and corny um, and citrus. And, you know, and if you want to know what really good corn whiskey is like, I can tell you what the Brits have uh, done, the, done the Americans, uh, shall we say, because that is bloody good. Um, the Henson single malt, I mean, yeah, it kind of ticks my boxes. It's gone down the sort of like the, um, the, cla the, 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 the classic kind of estuary sort of spirit kind of character. Um, it's, you know, not, not the world's most complex of whiskey, but it's a, a lovely whiskey to drink. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's really all that matters. Talking of lovely whiskies to drink the 11 year old English I mean it's starting to display some um, some maturity that slight sawdusty oak character but again lovely barley character you know I've been a big fan of of what the guys at St George's have been doing ever since they started and uh, do you well remember I did the uh, um, a couple of episodes of the show from the distillery a few years back um, and you know uh, they're just lovely people down there and I love the distillery and do not forget about them all right there's loads of new English distilleries cropping up um, don't forget about the St George's um, the uh, White Peak um, yeah again I really like what they're doing I've gotten you know I, I, I don't really have too much connection with the distillery per se shall we say um, but I'm kind of intrigued to see how they kind of like sort of um, continue. Hopefully over time they'll dial down some of the overt STR cask usage um, as the spirit starts to develop um, some more maturity and, and hopefully needs less STR cask influence. And, you know, I think, you know, eventually we will get to a point with, with them where you know, hopefully they'll release an entire uh, an entirely American oak or bourbon oak uh, cask um, bottling. So yeah, and on to the, uh, the, the the last two the uh, um, the apple brandy from Henson. Yeah, really good fun, really interesting. Uh, 
like I said, if you if you like Calvados and Mescal, you're in your element there because it really is quite quite a unique spirit, it has to be said. And I think that's one of the the things that's kind of drawn me to it is that it is very different and unique and you know obviously not to everybody's taste but I personally really enjoyed it and at the end of the day like I said you know these shows uh, th this whole channel is not is the good dram show and that does not necessarily mean everything has to be about whiskey um, although obviously as, as you as I well know that sort of certain spirits are you know don't get the kind of views but you know yeah, it's nice to introduce something a little bit different every now and again and the absinthe um yeah I like that I mean that that really was kind of full-on you know um, uh, what can I say yeah stick some water with that and you know bit of the hell out of your palate I mean that that that's that's intense that's not mugging around it has to be said and, you know, a lot of people, like I said, just sort of like go, no, nah, not really into aniseed, don't like licorice. And, yep, if you don't like that kind of flavour, then you're never going to like absinthe. But um, that, that really was bloody good. And, um, yeah, I, I'm, like I said, I'd happily have uh, the, old, uh, the old sip of that, shall we say. So, um, there you go. That's this week's episode of the show in the bag. Um, let's hope that the Germans get stuffed later on today um, because we always like to enjoy enjoy beating the Germans. It's it's one of those things, isn't it? You know, it's like beating the French. We always love to beat the French, um, even though they're, they're good friends of ours. You know, when it comes to sort of sport, yeah, we like to give them a good stuffing. So um, <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, I um, hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of the show. Um, not quite sure what we'll be doing next week, but, you know, you know, it's going to be fun anyway. So, until next week, um, good dramming and good afternoon.